Hi everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in to this Facebook Live. It's been a while since I've done a Facebook Live and I've been traveling and then right after, actually even before we got back home, Danny got the flu and then after that I caught it from him. So one thing after another and then of course jet lag from coming back here. Uh, I'm back in Los Angeles now and uh, so of course we had to get over the jet lag and one thing after the other. So it's taken me a long time to come back online and be here on Facebook live with you. So thank you for tuning in. I'm so happy to be back. I'm so happy to be talking to all of you. I just love doing these Facebook live videos because it sort of feels like I'm talking to you directly in real time, which it is. And I love to hear your comments. Um, I will be taking questions, but I wanted to speak about something specific first. So very often people write in to me and people want to know how they can heal people who are dealing with illnesses, dealing with cancer and things like that. And people ask me to come up with a, like a step by step. They say that I really need you to help me heal. I want you to come up with something step by step. What do I need to do? And I have always in the past been really reluctant to come up with any step by step doctrine or dogma, this is how you heal, this is what you need to do. Because to me, I feel it adds to the stress of for the person going through the illness. It just gives them one more thing that they have to do. And let me elaborate, but, uh, but stick with me and I will also give you tips and advice for healing, um, but from a different perspective. So anyway, when I was going through uh, cancer myself. Uh, Well-meaning people were constantly sending me healing advice and tips and websites and, uh, and all kinds of things. And everybody you go to, every website you look at, every naturopath, every, everybody you speak to gives you something different. And it used to really stress me out because I would read where people would say, absolutely do not take any dairy products, go completely vegan, um, you need to eat raw, you need to juice, or they would say you need to have wheatgrass every single day, wheatgrass shot will, uh, will really help you detox. Or people would say this is the detox program, you need to follow it. And what would happen is that I would go and I would follow it, I would buy all the products, I would get all the supplements, but it would add to my stress of already having to deal with the illness. And it would add to that stress where I now needed to do this. And every time you go to a different person, a different website, you get different information and it can be conflicting information. And then there's this fear, like, am I doing it right? If I follow Ayurveda, it's completely different from Western naturopathy, which is completely different from traditional Chinese medicine. And so when I used to live in Hong Kong, which is when this was happening to me, I was exposed to all these cultures and also all these all different people with different ideas of how to heal the cancer. And then, of course, there was the people who advocated um, conventional medicine and they would say you have to do the chemotherapy and the radiation or you die. But then you have the other people who say your body is already toxic, that's why you have cancer. So don't add to the toxins of the chemo and the radiation you're supposed to take away, you have to detox. And it everything I did felt so fearful. And this is why I've always felt if I give somebody a step-by-step -step way of doing things, I, I was trying to figure out how do I do that because I don't want to add to your already stressful life and feelings of, um, uh, of dealing with the illness and everything. I want to subtract from it. And that's what gave me the idea of how to address this question. Plus, one person actually asked it to me in a different way. This person said, how would you deal with it? That's me. How would I deal with it if I was diagnosed with an illness again? Now that is easier for me to answer. So first of all, um, 
I would want to say that if I had to deal with an illness again, I would, I would handle it very differently from the way I did the first time. The first time, the first thing I did was speak to doctors about treatment options. Uh, go on the internet and check all the options of naturopathy, which is what I said led to the confusion and led to the stress and led to me buying everything online to deal with cancer, to support cancer. The focus was on the illness. What I would do today is the opposite. The first question I would ask myself if I was dealing with an illness, and let me tell you, I had the flu from two weeks ago, and I dealt with that in the same way. The first question I asked myself is, where am I taking on things that I don't want to do? In other words, where can I say no? Where have I been saying yes when I meant no? That is the first thing I would do. So instead of taking on more dogma of what I need to do because I have cancer, I would do the opposite. What can I let go of? What have I been taking on that I really haven't wanted to take on? What have I been doing that I haven't wanted to do, but I just couldn't say no? So I would start to identify these things and I would start to let go of them. I really would. And um, I want to say here, this is an analogy I have used. I have used it several times, but I'm going to use it again, is that um, it's the story of Michelangelo and how when he used to carve these beautiful statues of angels and he would carve them out of rock, out of marble, but sometimes out of ugly blocks of rock, um, shapeless pieces of rock. And he would carve these beautiful statues of angels. And one time somebody asked him, how did you carve this beautiful angel from this piece of rock? And Michelangelo said, the angel was always there. All I did was chip away at what was not the angel and I set the angel free. This is what I feel about ourselves. We believe that when we look like that rock that there's something wrong with us. And in order to fix it, we add more. So when we have an illness, in order to fix it, we focus on the illness and we add more layers to it. In actuality, we're supposed to remove the layers, let go of what is not you and set yourself free. So that would be the number one thing is what can I let go of? What can I say no to? Uh, and I would start to do that. I did that when I had the flu from two. I did that two weeks ago when it started, when it really started to feel, when I really started to feel sick. And I can tell you even that exercise made me feel this relief, like, ah, okay, I can let go of this. I'm going to say no to this. I'm, and, and a lot of times I just said yes to stuff that I didn't want to do only because it was easier to say yes, because I didn't want to disappoint people. But when I really went back and asked myself, do I really want to do these things? There were so many things that I should have said no to. So I also want to acknowledge here that there will be some things that maybe you don't really want to do, which are draining you and tiring you, but you have to um, because it could be something like dealing with a special needs child or aging parents. And if this is the case, you would feel even worse to drop it. So I just want to remind you, there are certain things where life just deals it to us and we have to do it. But what I would invite you to do is to acknowledge it, acknowledge yourself for doing it and give yourself space to recover the energy. Give yourself permission to be okay with taking time out and not feeling guilty for taking time out to do something for yourself so that you have the energy to do those things where in many, in some cases where you don't have a choice and you have to do them even though it depletes your energy. Sometimes you can even turn it around and turn these things into fun projects or a fun game. Um, but just be aware that all these things are depleting your energy and think in terms of what would replenish my energy. But anyway, the number one thing is what can I say no to? What shall I let go of? <clears throat> the number two thing that I would do 
is that I would see where I am not receiving. I would learn to receive more. I would expand my receiving channel. So here's something that commonly happens is that our energy gets depleted and we become more susceptible to illnesses because we're giving and giving. We're not saying no, we're saying yes to all these things. We're giving and giving of ourselves, but we are not receiving. Many of you who have read my books, who follow me, who resonate with my words and my videos, you're very good at giving of yourselves. You're very generous with your energy. You're very kind. You're very empathic. And that's the thing. I attract a lot of people who are empaths, empathic people who feel the energies around them. You feel the illnesses of everyone else, but you're not good at receiving. You're not good at giving to yourself. I want you to be aware of this. And this would be the number two thing I would do if I was going through an illness myself. I would be aware of my receiving channels and I would make sure that I am receiving something good for me, even if it means doing it for myself, even if it means being more open to compliments or, or gifts from other people, I would make sure that I'm receiving and that I know I'm worthy and deserving of receiving. Because when you know you're worthy and deserving of receiving, then you know you're worthy and deserving of receiving good health. And start by allowing yourself to receive a massage, um, a half an hour soak in the bathtub, things like that, which you normally feel you don't have time to do. Remind yourself you do have time because it's really important to make time for yourself, especially if you're going through an illness. But even if you're not, these things that I'm talking about, these are what I would do to prevent an illness. Um, <clears throat> we have a habit of looking, when in, in terms of illness prevention, illness cure, we look at um, treatment options first. I wouldn't put that first. I would put that further down the list. That's what I would do differently from what I did the first time. So what would be the number three thing that I, I would do is the number three thing, maybe I could move this to number two, is okay, now that I have learned to receive, now that I've learned to say no to what I don't want, my life is starting to look better. The next thing I would do is I would start to get excited about life. I would now introduce things into my life that makes me excited. I would figure out how to spend more time with people I love. I would ask myself, have I been spending time with people I love? Am I following my passion? Um, what is my, have I got a reason to live? If I get healthy, if I get this clean bill of health tomorrow, what would I do with the rest of my life? I don't want to go back to that old life where I was just doing things that I didn't want to do, saying yes when I meant no, uh, going to a job that I hated. That was the life that gave me the illness. The illness is a wake up call to tell me that I am living a life that is not mine. So now what can I do to create a life that is mine and live a life of passion? Because when I get that clean bill of health, I want to go to a life that I'm excited about not that life that drove me to illness. And this is really, really important because to me, the biggest determining factor of my health is my reason to live. What is my reason to live? What is my reason for being? Um, am I following my passion? Do I feel I have a purpose? These are the reasons why I live and these are the reasons why I stay healthy. Not, it, it, there is no incentive in feeling that when I get healthy, I'm going to go back to that life that drains me. So this is so important. Um, and then number four would be my, the treatment choices. So now I've, I'm working out all these things and you can, you can also go and talk about your treatment choices while you are doing number one and number two and number three. But my point is in order of importance, I would put it in that order today. I would put number one, what am I saying yes to that I should be saying no to? 
Number two and three, interchangeable. Learn to receive and getting excited about life. Getting excited about life means introducing things that make me laugh more, spending more time with people that I love. Um, all these kinds of things, finding my purpose, finding my joy, all of it. And number four, treatment options. Okay, so here's what I wanna say about treatment options. Take the treatment options that make you feel safe and empowered, that make you feel that you are on the path to healing, that you're on the road to healing. I wouldn't go for treatment options uh, that make me feel really fearful. I used to do that and, uh, and I would feel fear if I went for them and fear if I didn't go for them. I was caught between a rock and a hard place. I would ask you to ask yourself, which of these treatment options makes me feel that I'm nurturing myself? And if you feel that chemotherapy is what you need because you trust your doctor and you know that what he's saying, um, that this would be the fastest way, and at the same time you can support your body in all kinds of other ways and support your life with, with, with uh, what I've told you as number one, two, and three, um, go for it. Go for chemotherapy. Go for radiation. Go for conventional treatment. Or if you feel you need to go for the natural route, go for it. Go for what resonates with you and work with a team of people who support your choices. Your health givers, they need to make you feel good about your choices. They need to make you feel that you are on the road to wellness. The driving force should not be that I am scared of illness and that's why I have to do it. No, because that adds to your stress, the stress you're already going through. The driving force is I have a passion for living. So what can I do to get me to this place of health so that I can live this life of my dreams? That's what you want. And you want to be with health caregivers that are going to support your choices of how to get you from here to health from here to thriving. You want to work with a team of people that can do that. You want to surround yourself with people, with friends, with family who are also going to support your choices. I know that when I went through illness, I was surrounded with people with different opinions of what I should do, and it added to my confusion. I would make sure that that doesn't happen this time. I would surround myself with people who are either on board with my choices and helping me and encouraging me, or I would see if I could stay away from them until I got my clean bill of health. <clears throat> so those are, those are what I would do. Number one, again, would be say, uh, what can I say no to? Number two, learn to receive, open my receiving channels. Number three, get passionate and excited about life. Number four, look at how to support my body. What are my treatment choices to support my physical body as I go through this journey of discovering what my passion and my purpose is? Those are the choices. Now, here's another thing I wanna say, is that for anybody who has lost a loved one to illness, I want to tell you that they did not lose the battle. It was their time. Maybe they didn't have a passion in life anymore. Maybe they lost their will to live because people that were important to them had gone. Or maybe they had reached the time when they were supposed to leave. They had reached that time in their lives. Um, I don't know how many of you remember that when uh, Debbie Reynolds she passed away, I think, literally a day or two after her daughter, Carrie Fisher, passed away. It happens very often even with couples where when one spouse passes away, another one passes away very, very quickly. It's because they've lost their reason to live. And that's okay. That's what I want to say. Don't force yourself. It's actually okay if it's your time. It's your time. If you're done here, you're done here. You haven't lost a battle. They haven't lost the battle. Wish them well. I'm not encouraging people to take their life. I absolutely am not. I'm encouraging you to find your passion for life. Um, so that is, that is really what I encourage you to do. Take your life back. Take your power back. Stop giving it away and saying yes when you mean no. Uh, and have a passion for your life. Be who you are. 
let go of what is not you so that you can live a life that is your life not someone else's life not what everyone else wants you to be a life that is your life and that's exactly how I would deal with an illness today. And I would love to take questions from you now. I'm gonna ask my wonderful husband, Danny, to, uh, to read out any questions that's caught his eyes. Also, if you know anyone who's going through an illness who you think this video will help, please share it with them. There's a question from Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Who says, what if what I need to do for my happiness devastating to my loved ones that's an interesting one I would uh, I wish I knew more about that one but you need to sit down and talk to your loved ones and work something out because if they truly love you they will want you to have this and they they will work something out it uh, I'm going to just guess it's something like maybe that will take you to live in a different country if it is really something that is your passion, that is what feeds you, that is the reason you're here, your purpose for being here, you need to talk to them so that you can work out a way that you can still be together, visit each other, schedule, uh, and where you can still pursue your dreams. But please, please talk to them. You, sometimes we underestimate how people will react. We think it'll be devastating to them, but in actuality, it's worse for them to feel that they are depriving you from being all that you are. And when you think about it yourself, if the situation were reversed, and if you knew that for that person, this is their reason for being, if you held them back, you would feel even worse. Um, my mom, she lives in India, and she would like nothing more than for me to be living with her and being with her. The thing is that for a lot of the things I do, like I love meeting people who have read my books, I love doing events, I love speaking with all of you, um, I love traveling, I, I just love what I do. I, uh, and so it would be very difficult for me to be exactly where she is because it's kind of uh, remote and cut off from being able to be at events whether it's in in the uk or the us or in europe or wherever and so i had to have a talk with her and tell her that i love i i love her and this does not compromise my love for her but i i the reason i came back from the other side was to fill, fulfill this dream and when i told her that she said that there's no way she could deprive me from doing that. She would never want to stop me. And now she started to be, <clears throat> she started to be extremely happy for me and almost lives through me and lives through seeing me doing what I do. I involve her in what I do, <clears throat> whether it's via Skype or via phone calls, and I make sure I visit her at least twice a year. So there are ways, there really are ways. And in the beginning, I thought it would devastate my mom as well if I moved away. But um, you can always work it out, and especially if they truly love you. And we'll get, oh, there are no more questions. So I wanted, until I have any more questions, I'm going to share, ah, okay. Stephanie asks, how do you change the pattern of fear? It feels like it's wired into my brain and I really want to move past anxiety and fear, yet it feels so ingrained into my body. I also notice a pattern of finally getting back on my feet and feeling better. Ah, so that's great that you notice, uh, Stephanie, that you notice a pattern of finally getting back on your feet. Okay, so fear is a survival mechanism. It's that fight or flight mechanism. Some fear is a good fear because it kind of tells you, like if you're crossing the street and, uh, you know, and, and you sense a car that's whizzing, that's, that's going too fast to stop, and there's that little rush of fear, it stops you from taking that risk of crossing the street. So... Fear in and of itself is not a bad thing. You don't want to get rid of it. It's hardwired into you for survival. That's how we've survived. You don't want to get rid of fear altogether, but what you want to do is you want to get rid of this constant, 
ongoing background fear, um, which we, our generation, our current culture seems to feel it. And a lot of it is because of the media, of the news and social media. It's because of how quickly we're getting information from all over the, the world that doesn't necessarily affect us. But especially if you're an empath, you're feeling it as if it does. You're feeling it as if it's happening outside your doorstep. But if you were to go outside your front door, you would see the world is safe. It is as it was yesterday. Your neighbors are still great. The grocery store down the store or down the road is still operating as it should. So one of the things that I would do if I wanted to um, start to unplug myself from fear is I would unplug myself from the media for, I would take a break, 24 hours, 48 hours. I mean, go as many as four or five days if you can. I, <clears throat> I am very selective about what news I watch. I don't watch the daily stuff that they put out that is every single day breaking news. Break, breaking news has lost, lost its meaning for me. I'm very selective. I go on the internet and I just check out headlines of international stuff that's happening all over the globe just to see if there's anything major. But other than that, I don't really get into the news because it doesn't help the world if we ourselves get into that fear-based space. So I would say get off social media and get off the news for 24 hours, 48 hours. Plug into music, plug into nature, go out for a walk, go talk to your neighbors. Do that for a day, two days, three days, four days, and you'll find that fear dissipates. And one other thing is to tell, is to maybe make a journal of all the positive things in your life, all the positive things in the world, all the positive synchronicities that are happening. Make a journal every day of these things until you wire that into your brain. All right, so I think we have one more question. What time for one last question before we have to go. And I like this question, right? Julie says or asks, what is your definition of true spirituality? Oh, I love that. Okay, true spirituality is being yourself. It's being authentic because you, you, every single one of you, you are all spiritual beings, whether you realize it or not. Um, whether you admit it or not, you are all spiritual beings. And people seem to think that some of us are more spiritual than others. Uh, you have to do certain things to be more spiritual. You have to work hard at being more spiritual. No, it's the opposite. It's back to that Michelangelo thing. You are spiritual underneath. There's only two types of people the people who know they are spiritual and the people who don't know they are spiritual. But all of you are spiritual. And so you, because you came from spirit, you'll go back to spirit. How can you not be? So being spiritual and being authentic is one and the same thing. You are an expression of God. Loving yourself and loving God is one and the same thing. You don't have to work at being spiritual. You don't have to work at being God. You just have to let go at what is not you. Let go of what is not spiritual. Thank you for that question, Julie. Oh, and you know what I just want to say, when I was uh, going through the flu two weeks ago and I started to ask myself, what do I need to say no to? And I realized that I was taking on a lot as well. So it's um, just because I had the experience I had and I talk about what I talk about doesn't mean I don't take on stuff that I don't necessarily want to do. Sometimes it's just easier to say yes as well. So I realized that I am kind of tired right now of traveling so much and being on planes and airports and everything. It's so tiresome. I actually prefer sitting at home and creating these videos for you. So I'm actually going to, uh, I'm actually trying to turn down more travel events and things and spend more time churning out these videos for you because I just love doing this. So anyway, there you have it. And I'm spending more time writing my book. I have started writing my third book, which I've mentioned a couple of times, and I'm really excited about it because it's really developing nicely and I'm enjoying doing that as well. Anyway, <clears throat> 
If you feel anything I've said will help anybody that you know, please feel free to share this video. And uh, I promise I will be back next week because I love doing this. I love you guys. Please keep asking me your questions because they inspire me for videos. I love you guys until next week. And also tune in to my radio show, Hay House Radio, on Wednesdays, 12 noon Pacific is when I do it live. But it is rerun all through the week. And of course, it's also in the archives. Love you guys. See you soon. Happy Sunday if it's Sunday for you wherever you are. Bye.